William Calabrew, uh, when we first heard about him and then heard him speak, we were just blown away by the resiliency. Um, he will tell you about himself. <clears throat> I will tell you that he's from the Washington, D.C. area, and he's currently an international advocate for children's and victims' rights and a consultant to SAMHSA, Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, <clears throat> and uh, for the uh, trauma-informed care, Center for Trauma-Informed Care. Before he gets started, he has a video he would like to show you. I do want to tell you that there are some sensitive areas in it, and he asks and we ask that you basically support and take care of each other. So we will start that right now. Coming up, Bill Cosby calls him a victor, the young man who refused to let the murder of his family destroy his life. Last year, Bill Cosby met a young man he says he'll never forget. William Kellebrew uh, grew up in a poor, crime-ridden neighborhood outside of Washington, D.C., and uh, recently took our cameras back to the place where he says his childhood literally came to an end. We're going to a home uh, where really was a, a focal point of my growing up with my mother, uh, the last days of, 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 of her being alive. It's been a while since um, I've even driven past, and I've, I don't think I've ever gotten out of the car. The last time William stood on this street, he was just 10 years old. It was July 2nd, 1984, when he woke up to the terrifying sound of his mother screaming. It was right there, right in front of the house, right in front of the driveway. Her boyfriend was dragging her. That's when he came in and he just started immediately loading his gun. And then he went over to my mother. And then he put the gun up to her face and he just shot her about two times in her face. And she dropped right on the floor immediately. And I just remember all of this blood coming out of her mouth and just going all over the floor. And then he went to my brother. And then he shot my brother. Then he came to me and he put the gun to my head. He squatted down, he, he did the squat like this and he put the gun to my head. I immediately said to him, please don't kill me, please don't kill me. I'll do anything, I'll do anything. And I asked him, and he didn't say one word to me. And that's when I looked up into the sky and was like, God, please, please don't let him kill me, please don't let him kill me. And it's for some reason he just pulled back and then he said to me, you can leave just ran right down here on the right and just was banging on the door. When they asked me, well, what's, what's going on, what's wrong, what's wrong? And I could only see my mother, my mother, my mother, my mother. And they kind of just, you know, settled me down, you know. They settled me down. Um, I was just, I didn't know what was going on, you know. Just pretty lost. <laughs> God, William, thank you for uh, taking us back there. But what happened to you? Obviously, you're here. William's here. Oh. William's here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So what happened to you after that? Wow, I, I lost everything. I mean, I lost my mom. I was a mama's boy, so I went everywhere with her. And, yeah. you know, that day I actually wanted to go with her. But, you know, when it came, came to me pleading for my life, I, I decided that I wanted to go the other way, just at 10. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, I was lost growing up as a teenager, and um, I didn't know where I was. I was just in a life of despair. I just mm -hmm. had my, all my feelings just bundled up. Mm -hmm. Didn't get a chance to actually talk about it. So who helped you? 
Wow, my grandmother. Mm -hmm. I mean, she jumped right in that day. Mm -hmm. And she's been going ever since. She worked, I think, a week after. Well, thank God for the grandmothers. <laughs> When I think about my resilience, my resiliency, you know, how am I able to stand here? When I think about that, I think about the example in my life. I think about the people in my life who were the models. And my grandmother, she's still alive. She's still getting speeding tickets. But she's become this amazing missionary. She volunteers every single day. And she is still the sort of matriarch for us. She still um, is the leader in our family. But after my mother and brother were killed, in fact, my, my grandmother's husband, um, he wasn't my biological grandfather, but he was a grandfather. And he was murdered just less than a month before my, my mom and my brother. So she had already faced tragedy in June. And she got a little bit of money because he was a veteran and there was Social Security, but she got a little bit of money and then her daughter was killed and her grandson. And she took that little money she had because my mom was on public assistance and welfare, so we didn't save for a funeral. She took that money and she buried my mom and my brother with my other grandfather's help. She dove right in that day, and she's never looked back. She worked for 38 years on her job. She was late less than 10 times. She knew her mission. And she never used an alarm clock. She was old school, if you will. But I always say my grandmother cheated a little bit. Because who's not going to wake up at 4 AM who goes to bed at 8 PM? Give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> Logic. <laughs> but she faithfully went to bed, and she faithfully did that. And so. What I didn't realize was that I watched television as a kid and I saw all my heroes and sheroes and, and I didn't know that you know, she was the shero getting up every single day. An ordinary person doing extraordinary work. And I am looking for the clicker and which is coming right here. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, John. I, have, I use enough of these things. Okay, here we go. It's only like two buttons on it, so <laughs> this shouldn't be hard. <laughs> but I, I must say, you know that video this morning, Kathy, that, that, that you showed? I mean, I just had a few tears streaming down my eyes, and I was thinking if the world could be so perfect, as our kids make kidly mistakes, could it be so perfect? And I imagine that world every day for our children, for our adolescents, and for individuals who grow up every day because even us adults are the sum total of who we once were and who we are today. So that means sometimes we act just like kids. Have, do you know an adult that acts just like an eight-year-old? Sometimes intentionally, <laughs> and sometimes without intention, right? You see it in the courtroom all day long, right? <laughs> right, Judge? But I'll tell you something. Through everything that I've been through, I have stood fast in understanding that healing is absolutely possible. That hope with expectations is possible, that rebuilding our lives is possible, and recovery is possible, and absolutely resilience, the ability to 
bounce back from adversity. And as I talk about this later, I'll explain uh, or, um, uh, or demonstrate you know, what resilience, uh, how resilience played a role in my life. So breaking the cycle. So we're going to go over a few, few pieces here. We're going to talk about my story, um, the, uh, my pathway to healing, and also some tools and strategies, because I just don't want to talk here. I want to leave you with something, some thoughts, uh, some ideas. Uh, and this is not prescriptive. So, you know, it's, it's based on, on, on what you want to do and what you implement to protect and support children. But these are some ideas to start with. So we'll move to that point. Monday, July 2nd, 1984, was arguably the worst day of my life. I had witnessed my mother being shot and killed in our family living room, along with my 12-year-old brother, and I was age 10. For a long time, it was indescribable for me, because I couldn't put to words what I had witnessed. I had left that house that day, our family living room, limited in my capacity to understand exactly what had happened. And number two, I didn't have any control over what had happened. I had lost my voice and my choice. When we talk about being trauma-informed, this is one of, the six key, uh, key, one of the six key principles. And voice and choice, empowerment voice and choice is key when we're talking about healing. But for me, I literally lost my voice that day. In fact, there was a three-hour, uh, police believe was, was a, was a, a three-hour um, um, standoff or barricade situation, not knowing that the man who killed my mother and, and brother had already taken his life when I left. But they waited three hours thinking that he was alive and trying to make contact with him. But for three hours, I didn't know I was in police, sort of police custody, and I did not know at all whether my entire family had been killed or not. So I'm sitting on pins and needles. So Richard Malika in his book, Healing Invisible Wounds, and for now I'll quote everybody else's book until I have my own, but <laughs> Richard Malika said that Behind every act of violence, there's humiliation. Behind every act of violence, there's humiliation. We will see in violence the absence of love, the absence of caring. So that was no different for me. I walked away from that house completely humiliated. If I had a voice, I could have said something that would have mattered. It didn't. If I, had some, if I could do something, it wouldn't have mattered. I lost, uh, and my family lost the most, one of the most important people in our family. One of the most, everybody was important. But my mom was, she was, a, she was the star of our family. She was the leader of our family. And she was a single parent, or I should say, she was in an absent parent home. So taking her away from five kids is not going to work. So it was devastating for us. That walking away from that, that house that day altered and shaped my world view. I, I, I immediately thought that this was just the unsafest place that I could ever be and ever imagine. Everything happened. Um, and Richard Malik also says in his book um, that he, he, he talked about this 10-year-old kid who witnessed his mom uh, being killed in, uh, in Rwanda during the Hutu massacres. And he described that child's experience as the child witnessed and hid and survived. And the child's experience, um, Malika said, he was forced to accept a new social reality. And also, this trauma disrupted a sense of connection, control, and meaning. Immediately, the physical connection was gone. The control, the meaning. I, I didn't understand exactly what had happened. I was rejoined with my family, and my grandfather, the next day, took me with him to his house. And um, I have five siblings. One was killed that day. So there are four left, one girl and three boys. So I went with my grandfather. I you know, fished with him, had a great time with my grandfather. I loved my, my, my grandfather. So the other two kids, uh, he was kind of rough. He was abrasive for them. So they would cry if they had to go over his house. So they went somewhere else. And I went with my grandfather because I was really close with him. Um, but my grandfather pulled up in front of his house, and a neighbor parked 
outside of his public parking space and outside of my grandfather's home. And my grandfather got upset, told his neighbor to move out of, out of the way because he was going to park there. The neighbor said no. My grandfather jumped out the car and he started um, in alter altercation. My grandfather immediately ran in the house. I ran after him. He found a gun rifling through his drawer, comes back outside of the house. I'm, I'm fast because I can run after him. I'm 10 years old, so I'm running after my grandfather. He comes back out the house and goes to his neighbor's door while it's ajar, and, and I'm standing behind him, and he shoots the neighbor. I witnessed two shootings in two days. And then my grandfather was taken off to, to jail that day. After that, um, you know, we're talking about, you know, my safety was, again, compromised. Um, there was more significant loss that day. Um, but, you know, in the midst of all that, something amazing happened. And my grandmother picked me up. And she, you know, put me on the passenger, passenger seat. And she drove. We were on our way to my uncle's house, her, 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 her child, child uh, one of her children. We were on, his, on our way to spend the night there. And on our way there, just, just she and I, on our way there, she stopped off at a Value Village thrift store. I don't know if you all know about that. She stopped at this thrift store. Now, our clothes had been demolished. I mean, our house was ransacked that night because people took a lot of valuables that night. And our clothes were destroyed from all the tear gas. And so we had to essentially start over. I actually never went back into my house ever again. The toys I was playing with while my mom and brother were being killed, I, I had stopped playing with those matchbox cars because he, he had pulled out the gun. But So I left those toys as I walked out of the house. So my grandmother, on the way to my uncle's house, stopped at a Value Village thrift store right in, right in Maryland. And she picked up some clothes, and then she let me walk down a toy aisle. And she let me pick out some toys. She didn't pick them out for me. She let me pick them out. And I picked out, and I can remember it today. I walked down that aisle, and I was looking for a, well, I was probably looking for a new toy, but probably no new toys in that aisle. <laughs> but I found a General Lee Dukes of Hazard car. <laughs> the doors wouldn't open, so you know they, this car was authentic. <laughs> I would have put it back. <laughs> Secondly, I picked up a toy plane where you can still put the action figures in. Today, those are remote control planes, but I had to make it fly myself. And little green army men that wouldn't move. And that night, the day after I witnessed those killings, and the same day I witnessed my grandfather shoot the neighbor, I played with those toys on the living room floor, and that's how I got to sleep and my grandmother slept in the room. There weren't many words between you know, my grandmother and I, but what she had done, she had, she had this entry point on the pathway to healing. The building blocks built on early, on, and a focus on, on values. Because she probably asked the question, well, you know, I can't bring your mom back, but what can I do? What can I do? So, so what can I do to, to, to um, foster an environment where it's safe, and she valued what was important to me. And at that time, it was toys. What kid doesn't want to play with toys? Well, some don't, but, but generally, I mean, kids want to play with toys. And that night, I played with those toys. That's how I coped. That's how I, I um, addressed what I was feeling inside. And then on July 4th, my grandmother, she, you know, without any of the training that we have in these conferences and, you know, in 84, she didn't do this. She didn't come in and do all, do all of this and learn about trauma-informed care or anything else, violence prevention. So uh, we went to a family picnic where they would display fireworks. <laughs> and you know when the fireworks went off, I ran for my life. I thought somebody was, I thought I was in the middle of a war. And they found me on the inside of the house, curled up on the stairwell, and children had surrounded me. Boy, children, how resilient. Children had surrounded me to comfort me, but an adult, I heard an adult in the background, I know, actually know exactly who it is, say, leave him alone. 
And days before the funeral, that same family member would pat me on my back and say to me, baby, you're just going to have to forget about it. But I know there was no forgetting. But I aimed to forget. I went back to fifth grade and I aimed to forget. I thought if you just forget about it, it'll go away. And I went to fifth grade. And can you imagine the fifth grade teacher standing up? And, and, and by the way, bless my teacher's hearts, all of them. They cared. They were wonderful. They did a great job. They put focus on education. But back then in 1984, there was no talk about the role that trauma really played. Well, generally, no, role about the, uh, no um, talk about the role that trauma played in my classroom. <laughs> because if my teacher understood that, I probably wouldn't have been asked, please stand up, to the entire class, please stand up, tell us your name, and tell us something about your summer. An ordinary question for one kid can be a re-traumatizing question and experience for another kid. And, the, the, and no choice, everybody had to introduce themselves. So, I, so you know, I was the only survivor from the room where my mother was killed. So um, I became isolated. I was immediately isolated that day. So standing up and saying my name in front of an entire class was isolating to me. And it was a trigger for me. I was scared. And later on, I would like, I actually, I would not want to go into barber shops. For instance, when I walk into a barber shop to get my hair cut, to sit in that chair and, and everybody's watching you. I had, later on in my life, I got a private barber to come to my house because I didn't want to go to the barber shop. This is the effects of, of, of trauma. I'm happy to report I do go to a barber shop today. <laughs> <laughs> so in the fifth grade, I was so fearful. You know, when I think about those kids in that video, Kathy, I'm like, wow, they're having such a good time. Who would want to destroy that good time? So I was hyper vigilant. I was aroused. I was hyper alert. So everything scared me. You know, sounds, jumps, anything. You know, I was just, I was on the plane, um, I was on the plane coming from Idaho yesterday. Thankfully, I made it. Kathy was checking on me every second of the way. But I was coming from Idaho, and something, somebody slammed the, um, the bin above me, and it was like, I just jumped for a second. I still feel it. You know, uh, Dr. Russell uh, Vanderkolk says that trauma lives in our bodies. Our bodies respond first. Try walking in here and it's being cold, it's, it's cold or hot, and you immediately, your body responds and your brain just catches up and says, hey, 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 it's cold in here. Your body's like, yeah, I already know. I'm shivering, dude. Can you tell somebody to please cut the heat on? <laughs> Our body responds to the conditions first. So I, I dissociate it. You, uh, you know, we talk about dissociation, but, um, you know, that's a defense mechanism. And, and, and one of the things about dissociation is it's basically you go off into la-la land. Um, one uh, expert described dissociation as stepping outside of yourself, going across the room and kind of looking over there, and you're not over there, right? Or bird's eye views, just stepping up and kind of seeing yourself from somewhere else. Or just staring off into space and, and, just, and just losing the moment. But for me, I dissociated. And that was my, the way that I, 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 I tried to, well, I didn't try to do this. I was unintentional. I didn't know I was dissociating. I didn't know I was, I knew that I was staring off for long periods of time. And I would stare off for long periods of time and I would identify something in a room and I just would be stuck. Do you know what happens to children when they get stuck and they're not paying attention when the lesson is two plus two equals four? When you're supposed to pay attention to your lesson, what happens? Oh, you, yeah, you get in trouble. So for not paying attention, I often got in trouble for not paying attention. And the punitive piece was write your name. This is when you have to write on a chalkboard. I don't know if we still do that, but I had to write on the chalkboard, I will pay attention. I will pay attention. I covered the entire, I remember that classroom in fifth grade. I covered the entire board and everybody else who had issues, they had to write on the board too. But sometimes I missed recess. Don't you think that I had so much tension built up leading up to recess that I needed to go to recess to release that? 
versus go right on the board, I will pay attention. We're going to talk about this a little later because it's strengths versus deficit-based approach. We're going to talk about that because dissociating in that moment was my strength. It was not my weakness. It wasn't something I needed to be penalized for or consequenced for. So staring off into space really supported me to get beyond the reality of the images I was seeing every single day. So dissociation for me at that period was a strength. And then avoidance. We, my, my grandmother didn't want to talk about it. Remember, our family strategy was to forget about it. And so what my grandmother did was pack all of the photos and all of our pictures of both my mom, and she put it in a black and gold chest, and she locked it. So I never saw my mom again. We didn't just bury her. We buried her. Because at the sight of her photo, it was just devastating for us to see. So my grandmother would start crying. Or you, two sentences about my mom, my grandmother would start crying. So I knew I couldn't bring it up. Or I couldn't bring it up. And nobody in my entire family wanted to hear what happened inside the house. As I grew up, I thought, well, I watched it. Why is it that everybody else does, can't hear about what happened in that house? And I, so I, I was, again, I felt isolated. In the sixth grade, so... I became very chatty, okay? <laughs> very chatty, chatty, chatty. Teachers always moving me um, and, and moving me away. Uh, I guess they thought I was best friends with the entire class because every time they sat me near somebody, I would start chatting. <laughs> and the guilt. No one knew that I was feeling so guilty about what happened. Because when my mom that morning came to the door with her ex-boyfriend and my brother, they were banging on the door, and I looked through the window pane, and I unlocked the door, and I opened it because they didn't have keys that morning. So I never told anybody that I opened the door. I just felt like once I opened the door, I let it happen. That's what I walked away feeling like at 10 years old, that I had helped, and I didn't understand it. I became protective over my brothers and sisters. I started fighting. Um, I started watching Bruce Lee. <laughs> to watch the karate movies, I became the biggest karate fan so that I could protect myself every step of the way. When it was dark, I could chop somebody up. I even became a cheetah in my mind. I watched the Thundercats. <laughs> this is really... And I watched, you know, the Thundercats. So I thought I was the male Chitara. That if somebody was going to come and get me, you don't have to worry about it. I'm gone. <laughs> That's helped me today, in fact. When I'm walking through a neighborhood I probably shouldn't be walking down in the middle of, if I see somebody cross on the side of the street and they look like, okay, I'm in, I don't even care if you're like, you know, you could be a 90-year-old woman. I'm like, I'm going to the other side of the street because <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen over here. All right? <laughs> so... And um, so in the sixth grade, my teacher sent me home with this report card. I don't know how it made it home, but my grandmother opened this report card. And it said in the improvement comments section, William is too loquacious. And I thought, I am third place in the spelling bee in the sixth grade. I have the, I have the proof. I was third, grade in this, third place in the spelling bee. If anything happened to one or two, I'd be the one in the regionals. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for something to happen, I tell you. I just wanted to get up there. I was so nervous. But I had to go to the regionals and sit there and watch the person actually go up and, and do it. But I was there. But William, was too lo William is too loquacious. But I said, this teacher had gotten something over on me because I didn't know what the word loquacious meant. Neither did my grandmother. So I said, hmm, I'm going to look this up. So I looked that word up in the dictionary, and my teacher was calling me talkative. <laughs> A chatterbox. Talkative. Well, if my teacher could see me today, I get paid to talk. <laughs> It was my strength. I had been shut down so much, and my voice and choice had been taken away so much that you wanted me to say anything. I wasn't talking about my mom's death, but I was saying something. So what my teacher did, bless her heart, 
I didn't know this, but she got me to read the spelling, bee, spelling words. Every Friday we had a spelling, a spelling test. And she used to make me read all the words every week, so I never had to take the test. So when I think about it, I say, well, she was trying to channel that energy. So that was a great thing that she was trying to do. And it actually worked because I, I'm a pretty good speller today. As you can see, I didn't really mess up anything. <laughs> <laughs> Seventh grade, OK? No therapy, not addressing what had happened. I became the class clown because I was telling jokes. People would laugh. But I get paid now to tell jokes, right? See, look. I'm not saying that to say that I have a big head about getting paid or anything, but to say that what I have to say today has value. And it's connected with so many people across the country in this world. We need more voices to be able to, to talk about this. But I'm saying that it's my strength. And we often see weaknesses, and we, we don't actually see the strength behind it and why, why that is, and I'll talk about that. So I became the class clown, and the feeling of helplessness. I was going to school every day feeling like isolated, helpless. I was guilty. Um, I became a victim um, of, of bullying. Um, some kid, kid had a locker, locker room next, a locker next to mine, and he thought I was going in his locker, and I, he came right up to me and punched me in my stomach, and I went down like on the ground, and he was like, oh, sorry, that's not your locker. I'm like, Oh, kid. <laughs> but that kid and I became friends, but he was my bully at first. And so down a slippery slope, feeling the shame, humiliated from what happened, and I go to gym class. And in gym class, you, uh, in gym class, they require the boys to change in the boys' locker room and the girls to change in the girls' locker room. Remember, in elementary school, what you had on, what you wore to school, that's the same thing you're going to be on the recess field with. But in junior high school, things changed. The culture changed. So they required us to change our clothes for gym. And if you had five minutes to change your clothes, and if you didn't have your clothes, you could not participate in gym class. So you had to sit on the sideline. Well, I never brought my clothes. I never wanted to change in any locker room in front of anybody at any time. Why? Well, at 13, I didn't really know what was going on. I just felt uncomfortable. Not really connecting it to what had happened to me at the age of six. I was violently sexually abused, violently sexually assaulted at the age of six, and I never said anything over eight years before I actually talked about it. So here I was in 13, a kid had been multi, multi, with multiple traumatiz traumatizations, poly-victimized, multiple victimizations, not understanding what is happening, and I'm in gym class sitting on the sidelines, and I'm not, being able, I'm not able to participate. And all of a sudden on the sideline, I become the class clown, I'm laughing at people falling, and, but yet I'm sitting on those sidelines and I'm surviving, okay? What grade do you think I got at the end of the two semesters? Because I, you know, I was participating, but not in the games. I got an F for failure, an F for failure. I didn't even get a D for damn attendance. <laughs> <laughs> but I came to class every day, and the teacher not knowing what had happened to me. So that F was my best effort, it was my A. Because I came, I sat in there, I survived that class, and I never, uh, and I never, I, I had perfect attendance, I had an honor roll, the only class I failed was gym. That's a sign. So, what happened? With all, the, all of this humili humiliation, I said, you know what? I'm just going to take William out of the equation. And one morning, I woke up, and I put my book bag on, and I took that $5 that my grandmother usually gave me, and she gave me two tokens for the bus. She taught me how to take the bus in junior high school. And I took, took that, and I started walking off to school. I didn't catch the bus. But I aimed to jump off of the neighborhood bridge on my way to school, and my grandmother didn't know it. I arrived at that bridge that day, and I stood over that bridge, and I was just about to jump. And I debated heaven or hell, whether I'd ever see my mom again. Am I disconnecting myself from the everything? 
It was so confusing. So I guess I decided, like any kid, let me come back later. <laughs> I made it to school, and there was this assistant principal. Um, I couldn't concentrate, so this assistant principal named Mr. Christian, he was a disciplinarian for the boys, and I often would go to his office, of course, <laughs> for discipline. But his office became a haven. He became a trusted soul, a person who said, you know, if you can't concentrate in class, you can sit here. So I sat in his office quite often. And I learned my lesson because I watched the other kids get disciplined after a while, and I just sat there. But I, I know that that was a haven for me in the seventh, eighth grade. So Mr. Christian noticed that I was completely distraught this morning. And he said, you know, I call your grandmother. He called my grandmother at work. And my grandmother called Children's Hospital, and Children's Hospital called the school. And they both agreed, OK, can William walk to the, to the hospital? It's only about 10 to 15 blocks away. And I said, yes, I can make it. And I promised I'd make it. And I had to walk past the bridge for a second time. I made it. I got to the hospital. They did an assessment. And they hospitalized me for 30 days in an adult program um, for adolescents who were over 13 because Children's Hospital went up to 12 years old. So, 30 days in this adult program, and I'm learning, learning a lot of things. I'm like, this is new. I'm the first time I've stopped to really address any of the issues that were happening in my life. So they released me, and they assigned me to, uh, referred me back to Children's Hospital, and they assigned me to this therapist named Christine Pierre. Interesting. I remember her name. Christine Pierre. She was from Grenada, so she had this British accent, and... When I sat in her office, I'm thinking, wow, you know, I'm like a child actor, too. My mom used to make me get up and do Michael Jackson dances, so I was growing up as like this child singer and actor, even if it was just in the house. And for Christine Pierre, what Christine Pierre didn't know was like, I'm an actor. So I'm listening to your, 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 your accent, and it's becoming a conversation piece, right? Now, we all have natural conversation pieces, but some people, you know, kind of design conversation pieces so kids could you know, come in the room and say, oh, I like that. For me, it was Christine's British accent. Because what well, Christine didn't know that I was actually leaving those sessions and actually practicing the British accent, you know, all, you know. <laughs> I was actually practicing the British, British accent every day, you know, and. <laughs> I know, I know, it's crazy, right? But, 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 I actually went to study in England. I did some college in, at the University of Sunderland in England. As I was the first educational exchange student from the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., to the University of, of Sunderland. It was part of what you call the Friendship Pact. It's a sister city. They're sister cities because Washington, D.C. Um, is connected to, uh, to the, the city of Sunderland because the, our first president, um, he has an ancestry. There's the first ancestral home of our first president. So that's why it's connected. So they say we're going to connect it educationally with business and technology. And so I was the first person to go over from, to represent the United States, our city, to this school. And in fact, it was so high profile that the mayor and the city council actually named me as the 94th worldwide ambassador for the city of Sunderland. I represent them in a lifetime appointment. That conversation piece was something else. She never knew I was going home practicing the British accent, but it exposed me to this place called Britain. What is that place? So Christine Pierre introduced me to the system in a way that I think is the standard. The way that we should introduce children, adolescents, anyone to any system. She started the, the, the session in the office, and she worked her way down to the cafeteria. And in the cafeteria, she stood there in the cafeteria at the children's hospital, which I, I love that place, and she just put out her hand and said, what do you want for lunch? And I looked at that lady as a 13, 14-year-old. I looked at her, and I'm thinking, we're displaced. My grandmother moved in with her sister. We don't have her home. We're in a three-bedroom. There's eight kids in the house and six adults. And... When my mom was alive, I'd, be wa I'd watch her prepare food. So anything dropped on the floor, I was right there to get it. <laughs> I watched her prepare food, and I was like number one, uno numero, to get food. Greedy, if you will. I know it wasn't greedy, but I was greedy as a kid, right? But in this new home, you could be fifth in line, and they run out of fries. <laughs> and you're like, okay, 
you know, you know, my food's not important. What's going on around here? So they have to start up new fries. But I'll tell you what, Christine Pierre, I looked at her in that cafeteria, and I guess I said, I'm going to clean you out. <laughs> I went into that cafeteria and I must have built the biggest ice cream cone you can build on this side of Earth. It was falling over like the Tower of Pisa and, I mean, putting it back together, licking it. I mean, I remember it. I remember I still build ice cream cones like this today. <laughs> the only difference is, unfortunately, I'm lactose intolerant. So, <laughs> too much ice cream. Horrible. It's traumatic. It's a re-traumatizing thing. Ice cream was my favorite thing in the entire world. But I sat across from Christine Pierre in that cafeteria dining room. And I always say about those social workers, you got to be careful. Because they will trick you into telling you all your secrets. <laughs> she had an ear. I was chatty, and she had an ear. <laughs> and I sat across from her in that cafeteria many, many times. And um, every week, probably two times a week at first, um, that's what I needed because I was on suicidal precautions at first and my entire teenage life on suicidal precautions not feeling like I was worthy not feeling like I Didn't have a lot of dignity at that point my self-worth had been shut down So Christine Pierre was something else. So I'll tell you 27 years later or 25 years later I sent this email marketing message out saying, for Suicide Awareness and Suicide Prevention Month, I said, these people had saved my life. Christine Pierre, Charles C. Christian, Pamela Alexander, my music teacher, these people, Melvin Andrews, all of these people I remembered had saved my life. And I was going to jump off of a bridge. And then I was, you know, at suicidal thoughts my entire teenage life. So these people had really, literally saved my life. And so I really wanted to talk about them and talk about the role they played. So I got an email message back saying, are you talking about Mr. Christian that worked at Langley Junior High School? I said, yeah, I am. I said, do you know him? I said, well, yeah, that's my great uncle. He's my family member. And I said, well, he had a lot of gray hair back then. Is he still alive? <laughs> no, I got a few strands myself. But I said, is he still alive? He said, well, yeah, he's alive. Do you want his number? Yeah, please give me his number. And I said, well, how old is he? He said, he's 86 years old. I said, well, give me his number right away. <laughs> Not that 86 is the cliffhanger. <laughs> but I wanted my chance to thank Mr. Christian while he was alive. And I picked up that phone, and I gave this number a call. Ring, ring. May I speak to Mr. Charles C. Christian, please? This is Charles Christian. Wow! Mr. Christian, this is William Kellerbrew. Do you remember me? And he said in that raspy voice that I remember from junior high school, he said, Hey, Billy Boy! And I thought, yeah, that's Mr. Christian. <laughs> no one else would ever call me Billy Boy in my life. That was like a passcode, and that was it. And I said, Mr. Christian, I just want to thank you so much, because if you didn't intervene, I wouldn't be here today. And he said to me, well, Billy boy, I've been watching you on television. He lives in my city. He says, I've been watching you on television and listening to you on the radio, and I know you made it past the ninth grade. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't want to tell him, and past the bridge. <laughs> I'm on a roll. I never felt that way before, that I could go back and thank the people had, who had made a difference in my life. And so I said, I've got to get a, I thought about this really, I've got to get a caravan or a V-bug or a plane or something, and I've just got to put Christine Pierre's name on it because I'm going to find that lady. And I did the 2014 V-bug plane thing, and I put her name in the Google search engine box and 501 million of them showed up. <laughs> Needle in a haystack. I said, oh, wow, okay, she had a British accent. Is she in England? <laughs> or is she in the area? So I looked in Washington, D.C. area, and I, in the region, and I found some Christine Pierre's. So I emailed one of them and called another. I didn't get through to the others, but um, a few weeks later, I got uh, a message from my office saying somebody had contacted them named Christine Pierre, and they gave me a number. And so I said, could this be the Christine Pierre? So I dialed that number, and ring, ring, 
May I speak to Christine Pierre? This is Christine Pierre. I said, well, like patient's records, I'm going to verify this. Did you work at Children's Hospital back in 1988, 1987, 1988? And she said to me, yeah, I did. And I said, wow, Miss Pierre, this is William Calibro. Do you remember me? She said, no. <laughs> all her violence prevention, trauma-informed care points, all that CEUs was down the drain at that point. <laughs> She said, well, tell me who you are. I don't know. So I started to tell her my story. And she said to me and interjected, she said to me, I know who you are. She said, I don't remember your name. I vaguely remember your face. But I remember I had to tell you something when you were my patient. And I couldn't believe that she remembered this question or tell me something 27 years later. And I said, well, I'm not your patient. Can you tell me what it, what it was? She said to me, when you were my patient, my mother died. She said, my mom was my rock, William. She didn't see me graduate from college. And that's the one thing I wanted her to see. So every time I walked into that office, she was with me all the way. With the policies and procedures and the standards and accreditation, all these kind of things, basically says you cannot, as a therapist, dump all of your issues out on a 9-year-old or 14-year-old kid. <laughs> so in those sessions, she had lost her voice and her choice. But what she did, was well, she opened the portal to and asked the question, what does William value the most? And she opened that portal to that cafeteria, and it was ice cream that would be the thing that would connect us. She answered that question, what was important to me, what I valued the most. And I never forgot it, that she cared, that she had compassion. I don't think she ever told me that she cared about me. You know, Maya Angelou once said, people will forget what you said, they'll forget what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. And that is the way I remember Christine Pierre, except I remembered her name. Because I never would have a therapist who would connect like that uh, in that special way at the beginning. I've had other therapists, and they were wonderful, but she set the standard for me in the very beginning, my introduction. And so I asked Ms. Pierre, what was your job back then? Because I always call you life-saving therapist. What, who are you? <laughs> and she said, I was an intern social worker. And I said, an intern saved my life? <laughs> Anybody can do this work. <laughs> like, they put my life in the hands of an intern. <laughs> And she rocked it. <laughs> she was in her first year at the University of Maryland School of Social Work, her first year in her master's program. And her colleagues at some point thought she was, didn't even, wasn't even qualified to do that. But we can make a difference. And today, just three days ago, Christine Pierre, for the first time, we've been together but for the first time, she attended a session like this. She sat in here and listened to me tell my story. And can you imagine, after saying that, saying, and that woman, that amazing woman is sitting right there, and she didn't even want to stand up. She didn't know she had made that impact in my life. And she, I, I signed her paper, and she got her CEUs. <laughs> I am giving back. <laughs> you know, we do this work every day. Nope, that can't go that way. <laughs> we do this work every day. And from the looks of it, from you know, meeting Kathy and, 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 and meeting Adam and meeting Eric, you're passionate about this work. You get up every day, not because you get paid millions of dollars to do it. In fact, a lot of times you're underpaid for what you do. 
There's no dollar amount for the work that you do. Working and protecting and supporting our children to become the healthy adults that we aim for. But it's often a thankless position. Often a thankless position. If you're thanked, you're so lucky. If you're thanked and appreciated, it's a wonderful thing. So I want to tell you, if you haven't heard it before, or if you heard it yesterday, and this is being reiterated for you, I want to tell you thank you. 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 Thank you, 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 thank you again, thank you again, thank you, 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 standing at the door, thank you. Standing at the door, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. When you're standing, you get the individual, thank you. <laughs> I don't ever want to do a presentation where I don't thank the people who serve every single day. It's the reason why I'm standing here. Give yourselves a huge round of applause, please. An Indiana judge once said, as long as we operate from our hearts, we'll never be wrong. We may make mistakes, but if we operate with pure intention, we won't be wrong. And a paradigm shift is needed today. We're talking about asking the question, what happened to you versus what's wrong with you? And we ask that question so often, you know, what's wrong in the most compassionate way? What's wrong with you, baby? It's not about what's wrong with me. It's about what happened to me. We have to look beyond behavior to see the meaning and what is going on for our children. So I went to the mental health system, nine plus hospitalizations. This is my mom and my brother here and uh, my, my siblings. My oldest brother, uh, he went to uh, coping um, by using substances for over 25 years, okay? Pardon me, 25 years of substance use, went to jail for 18 months got out of prison, um, and now he's two and a half to three years out of prison. We wrapped our family support around him. He went to rehab three times, got, got the ankle bracelet on, got it off uh, within 30 days while going back to prison. And so I can report today that he is surviving, and he is doing it, and he's doing a good job, and he's also working a little bit. So um, that's what happened to him. And my next to the oldest brother was murdered that day, and then me, and my sister sitting beside me, in fact, uh, she was on our Oprah program, but she, um, she actually used faith, and we all used faith, but she used faith to really do it. So she became a minister, and she gave her first public message about a month ago, and, I mean, and she had the church on its feet. I mean, she did such an awesome job. She's raising her children. She's doing an excellent job, and, and I just can't say enough about her. And my brother net didn't fare so well. Um, uh, six years ago, he was sentenced to... Uh, he was convicted of 18 felony counts, sentenced to 97 years in prison. 83 years will pass by before he's eligible for parole, and he'll be 113 before he's eligible for parole. I asked him a question that was an ordinary question, how are you one day while he was in prison? And he said to me, I feel like I've been buried alive. He said, you know, your issue was, I mean, you guys got to know mommy, but my issue is I never got to know her. So he felt completely neglected, completely neg neglected. And it was frustrating to be in school like that, thinking about how frustrated I was. He was very frustrated. And he was on the bottom sort of the totem pole, so he was being bullied the most in the family. So some key things to remember here is that a values-based approach is so important. Values-based practices is a new skills-based approach. It's alongside evidence-based practices. But when we start asking the question of the people that we serve every day and we engage, what is important to you? What's the most important to you? We begin a person-centered approach whereby I start with what's important to you. Not me, but you. And then we can move forward in terms of the kind of care we're talking about. Strength-based versus deficit-based approach. I'll talk about that in a second. Trauma-informed approach is absolutely key. I know there's a lot of trauma-informed care that everybody, did, everybody has done here, but trauma-informed approach is, is key. 
and all behavior has meaning. Symptoms are adaptations and comfort versus control. So quickly, I'll just talk about values-based practice. As I mentioned, it's a new skills-based approach to working with complex and, and conflicting values in healthcare. But our values drive and drive our, um, our, our, our values help to drive our decision making, um, our actions, and our behavior. So that's why we start with values because what we believe. My value system was my value and belief system was completely disrupted. So I had to start back at the beginning in terms of what do you value? What's important to you? And my grandmother got that right on the second day. So what is important to you? What do you value the most? What makes you happy? Any of those questions. So a strength-based versus deficit-based approach focuses on strength, which is collaborative partnership, or versus facing authority. Look at some of these examples. Uses ability versus confronting inability. Enhances motivation versus confronts resistance. Starts something versus tries to stop something and provides assistance versus mandates activity, like I need you to get it done versus let me assist you or let me support you in getting this done. And it also focuses on ability versus presumes inability. Like, oh, I saw cops one day, uh, you know, about a year ago I saw cops, and the officer said, oh yeah, she's been back here nine times, we just arrested her again, she'll be back here a tenth time. Well, if we believe she's gonna be back here a tenth time and we're speaking it like that, maybe it's gonna happen. So we wanna focus on the ability of the person to be beyond that. So understand resistance from a person's perspective versus judges resistance from a list of logical points. Oh yeah, well, she's a bad person or he's a bad person. He's just gonna do that. That's his, just, that's his nature. Well, why? Why? And my favorite, change versus compliance. Change versus compliance, okay? So when I was in the seventh grade, that, that whole compliance piece about not having your clothes and not being able to participate, well, also, I, you know, I have an example of what happened to me in the swimming pool. I used to swim in public, public swimming pools, and when I used to go to the pool, I used to avoid, what other, when you first walk into the, to the, to the, um, to the pool, you have all the rules. And the rules say you have to take a shower before you get in the pool, no shoes, no t-shirts, no this. Well, guess what? I didn't want to take off my clothes. What do you think I had to do? I had to find a time when the lifeguard wasn't looking and dive into the pool. <laughs> now, I'm not against rules, but when you use rules and compliance first as your first introduction, that is a culture of violence when you use force first. Why not ask a person their values first? Start with who they are. And then move to, well, these are some guidelines or these are some rules. These are things that we need to all follow. But how are you? <laughs> how are you first? How do you feel first? So we can bring humanity back into our space, no matter what. Trauma-informed approach. So um, I don't think I have a lot of time here, but the trauma-informed approach focuses on um, SAMHSA came together and, and brought together experts and consumers in the field and talked about, uh, you know, a working definition of trauma. And one of the things that came out of that was that the three E's were about the events, the experience, and the effects. And I'll just say about the event that two people are in a car accident, one person goes to work the next day, seems like nothing's go nothing happened, and the other person goes home and stays in bed for five days. What's the difference? The accident, the event, is not the trauma. It's the fact that the event completely overwhelmed the person's capacity to cope, which made it the, the trauma. And once we understand that, we understand why somebody would go home and stay in bed. And also, trauma is an individual experience. No two people will ever go through it alike. It is a fingerprint on our experiences. That's why we don't compare traumas. But we do it every day. We say, you know, but baby, you've had it much worse than I've ever had it. Well, we just invalidated our own experiences to, to validate somebody else's, and it's not com comparable. Not at all. And the prevalence. We don't know who has been affected by trauma, but 61% of men and 51% of women reported exposure to at least one lifetime traumatic event. So we don't know who it is. So we're better off presuming that the person who's sitting next to us may have had a traumatic ex uh, experience, so we use what we call universal precautions. Universal precautions for the medical model, when we talk about universal precautions, what do we do when we visit somebody in the hospital, or nurses do, or doctors do when they have a patient? They use, right, gloves, things like that, to avoid the spread of infectious disease. But when we're talking about trauma, we must understand that trauma, I believe, is the germ of the 21st century. So you don't know where it is. You don't know what it's sitting, and we can spread it just by, just by asking a question we think is ordinary, but re-traumatizing for a kid.
We don't know. So we use exercise universal precautions. We presume that there's tr a history of trauma so that we do two things. Number one, we avoid re-traumatizing the person who's been traumatized. And number two, we do no harm if a person has not been traumatized. All behavior has meaning. When we judge behavior, we may miss the opportunity for understanding the meaning. Trauma gives us or provides us with an explanation um, or a reason. It is not an excuse for behavior. Marshall, the man who killed my family, is not excused for killing my family. Not one bit. If he was alive today, he'd probably be in prison. But I would ask him the question, what happened? What, what led down this pathway? So we know that behavior has meaning. And um, how much time do I have? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay, good. Symptoms as adaptations. I'll tell you. This is like a clinical term, but, you know, I, I'm not good with clinical terms, right? The DSM-5 needs to be a pamphlet for me. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm afraid to pick that book up. I'm serious. <laughs> so symptoms as adaptations. What does this mean, though, right? Because um, for me, I grew up in, in you know, dissociation and avoidance uh, in the short term. But in, we know in the long term, that can be very harmful, staring off into space all day long. Why? Because it impairs our daily functioning. Like the person in that car accident, if they never got back up and went to work and they live in a rural, rural part of town, well, how can they get to work if they're never going to get back in a car? When it disrupts your daily functioning and who you are, it, it, it can be very harmful for you. So for me, it became very harmful because I hated the calendar. So I, when July 2nd came around, I was like, I don't want to know what date it is. When the summer came around, I was like starting, my body responded to it, and I started to get depressed. So symptoms as adaptations and understanding that all behavior has meaning. Um, uh, Patricia Wilcox has this example on a... Um, on the internet. She says, this guy named John is traveling down the river. He's kayaking. He's having a great time. And all of a sudden, the river starts raging, okay? And John actually capsizes, loses the kayak. He's going down, and he sees this log coming down the, down the stream. And he says, oh my gosh, I get to this log. So he swims over, nearly drowning, holds onto the log, going down the river, hitting bumps, getting bruises, nearly dying. And you know what? He holds on for dear life. All of a sudden, that river ejected John and the log into a tranquil pond. And there's some people on the embankment just saw this transition and said and yelled out, hey, you're safe now. Swim over here. The water's not that deep. Come on. And John's like, homie, don't play that. I don't even know who you people are. And you're telling me I'm supposed to trust you that the water's not that deep after what I just went through? That log saved my life. And if you can replace this log with a helicopter, <laughs> fine. We must ask the question of the people on the embankment, what are we doing to throw a life preserver out to John? Maybe he would grab it, maybe he wouldn't. But what are we also doing? Maybe we could swim out to John and show him that it's not that deep. What am I saying? We've got to meet people where they are. We have got to meet people where they are because that same log for John is the same person's bag of potato chips in the middle of a movie and it's finished less than two seconds or a bag of popcorn. It's the thing that helps me to soothe. It's that jog in the morning. It's that music that I listen to on my way to work. It's that, uh, it's that crystal meth that I use to be able to cope. It's that whatever I use to be able to cope. It could be the next person's that. So until we work and support them to replace those things, that's what they're using to be able to survive. So these are survival strategies. So we've got to be able to talk about healthy coping. We've got to be able to talk about effectively being able to cope and, and work to expose individuals to other coping strategies like my grandmother did, expose me to a whole thing of toys in a toy aisle. I couldn't have done that myself. That's the story there. And then, of course, realizing the prevalence for trauma-informed care and recognizing signs and symptoms are important, and then respond by putting our knowledge into practice is key, and then let's resist actively re-traumatizing individual. And again, prevention is key. Not going to go into there. Also, self-regulation. Identify triggers. Early warning signs and uh, coping. These are key triggers here because we have our, have our individual triggers, but feeling of loss of control is our number one uh, um, trigger. Power differential, when somebody has power over another person and lack of predictability, when you don't know what's going to happen in the next moment. If my teachers knew that, they'd know they not take control away from me. Um, uh, they don't get into a fight and impose their will. They know that they're not just going to have keys dangling around me. So, you know, uh, 
you know, this power differential, um, and lack of predictability. They'll tell me what's going to happen next. This is the structure of the day, everyone. Okay, I'm going to move fast past this because you can have this. Okay, this is all yours. Okay, so we're not going to do that. And I just want to tell you that self-care is so important. You know, I liken self-care to what happens on a plane when the flight attendant says, if necessary, the oxygen mask will fall from the compartment above. Whose mask are you going to put on first? Please do. Some people say, I'm going to put my child's on, but I'll tell you, you have five to eight seconds before the cabin pressure changes. Are you going to rely on your seven-year-old kid to read the instructions to put your mask on? <laughs> or are you going to put your mask on? When we get up every single day to do this work, we understand that wellness and well-being is key in our delivery in the day. So think about where we are. Ask, you know, how well are we when we get up? Are we ready? Do we have an attitude about to go in here? Are we carrying yesterday's issues into this, into this workplace? Or are we going home with the stressors from the day? What is happening to us? Because we have to ask ourselves, are we the barrier or are we the pathway to somebody else's healing? Are we the barrier and the pathway to rebuilding what's needed? And I say to the world, we may be one person, but to one person, we may be the absolute world. That's been proven in my life by the people who have served so valiantly. I didn't do this. <laughs> okay, so I am, so I have a quick video. Um, it's a two-minute video just to kind of show you some of the things that I'm actually doing today because I didn't talk a lot about what I'm doing. Uh, but I'm doing a lot of values-based work, um, especially in a place, uh, uh, the Commonwealth Center for Children and Adolescents, we're doing values-based work. So we used to have this personal safety assessment when a child comes in the first we're joined now by hours. William Killebrew, a gun safety a advocate with a long history of... Um, CCCA, what they're doing is the first question they used to ask is um, on the assessment... What makes you upset? What are your triggers? That's the first question they ask you within 24 hours, right? And the second question they ask is, how, what, what do you use to calm down? And they gave you some pictures and some you know, words. And that was the two questions they started off asking you in this assessment. Well, going there, working with them on values, the first question now they ask in order to develop a safety plan is, what's important to you? That's the first question you have on a personal safety assessment. I actually have it and can actually give it to, um, give it to uh, Kathy give it to Kathy, this, um, this assessment, I can give it, uh, give it to you. But uh, the first question is, um, what's important to you? Secondly, what's your coping strategies? Then warning signs, and then triggers. So, video, please. Thank you. We're joined now by William Killebrew, a gun safety advocate with a long history of dealing with gun violence. Thanks for coming in tonight. Well, thanks for having me on, uh, on it. Yeah, and I don't really want to make this a discussion about whether people should or shouldn't have guns because that can go in a whole other direction. I just want to talk about how parents can begin the conversation about guns and safety with their children. They're waiting. They're not sure if there's a standoff going on. They're not hearing right. a response. And you're communicating to them, hey, my mom and my brother are in there. My brother may still be alive. Um, thank God for my grandmother because she was another female who stepped in and, and, and really made it happen for me. And joining me now are two people with a very personal stake. At age 10, William Killebrew watched his mother's ex-boyfriend shoot and kill his mother and brother. He shared that story last week with the Vice President's Task Force on Gun Violence. Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, my heart goes out to the victims and survivors of uh, Newtown, uh, but also to victims and survivors all across our country uh, where the violence is playing out on the streets every day.
helps us to understand all of those different connections in a real way. and he's a student. Oh, he's already on stage. <laughs> that was awesome. What school do you attend? I go to the Northeast School of the Arts. The Northeast uh, School of the Arts. And what happened is um, Kathy and the team saw me on YouTube singing with a celloist. And they said, well, we're going to we're gonna set that back up. So I hope you're ready, John, because that was a different celloist last time. <laughs> So, um, but you know what, the arts played a major role in my healing, and anytime I, I get a chance to um, support this kind of collaboration, um, I, I really appreciate it. So let's give it up for John Chesterfield to come on. I was once an audience member, so I know you can't see. <laughs> <laughs> so this, my, my mother used to wake us up on Saturday mornings and she used to make us clean the entire house to, jo uh, to not to Josh Groban, to Boy George. That is not what I'm going to do for you. I don't have any photos, I don't own any cars, any toys, or any tangible thing from my childhood. But my mom loved music. And so it was the way that I stayed connected with her. I went to performing arts school myself. And I used music to be able to survive because it wasn't a talent at first. It was pure and sheer survival because in those dark days, dark days, in those dark nights, it was music that would be the equalizer for me. So, You Raised Me Up, made famous by Josh Groban and again, John Chesterfield on cello. And oh, my soul so weary When trouble comes And my heart's burdened me Then I am still And wait here in the silence Until you come And sit a while with me you raised me up so I can stand on hands. You raised me up to walk on stormy seas. I am strong when I
shoulders You raise me up To more than I can be You raise me up To all that I can breathing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. What an honor. All right. Now it's time for a break, but uh, William, <laughs> I can't say anything to that. William will be here all day, so, and he would love to speak with any of you.